All right. Well, uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I'm David Zilber. And on behalf of my co-organizers, Elisa Caffrey, uh, who's with us, and Justin Sonnenberg, who unfortunately can't make it today, um, I want to welcome you to the final installment of season one of the Fermentation and Health Speaker Series from the Center for Human Microbiome Studies at Stanford University's School of Medicine. Earlier this month, uh, we spoke with Maya Hay about the importance of transdisciplinary research, and how expanding fermentation research teams to include social sciences and humanities can not only benefit scientific research, but also bring us a critical lens to understand the implications and impact of all this research. So we wanted to end this season of the series with someone who had been thoughtful about transdisciplinary fermentation food research, Dr. Rob Dunn. Rob is an evolutionary biologist, currently a professor at both the Center for Ele Evolutionary Hologenomics at the University of Copenhagen and the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University, where he holds the distinguished title of Senior Vice Pro of University D Interdisciplinary Programs. His lab, called the Public Science Lab, has published a number of papers understanding human microbe relationships from understanding how deodorant can shape your armpit microbiome to mapping the relationship between sourdough microbiomes and the hand microbiome of their bakers. This sourdough hand mapping has expanded into larger science of sourdough projects that you can read more about on the lab's website. There are a number, there are a number of other projects the Public Science Lab helps to coordinate. I'm sure Rob will touch on those uh, and more today. Um, so Rob, Thank you so much for joining us and feel free to take it away. Thank you so much. And, and I'll say that I have the longest church bell in, in uh, East, Eastern German history going right now. So apologies for the background noise. Um, so, so it's it's really an honor and a pleasure to be able to, to talk today. I'm just going to pull up my slide. Um, and what I'm going to talk about and talk around today is how, how we should think about the ecology and evolution of fermentation by humans uh, and how we should think about it in, in the biggest possible picture and lens and in a way that pulls across different disciplines. And as David mentioned, I have the luxury of being able to work with theologians and economists and historians and uh, and folks from all sorts of different disciplines and, and in the process to, to think about how do we collectively really think about this story. But as a brief aside, before I dig into the human story of fermentation, I think it's worth mentioning that the human story of fermentation is actually a specific case of a broader phenomenon in, in nature, that if, if we look across animal species, it's actually relatively common that non-human animals employ fermentation. And by, by fermentation here, I mean the the use of microbes to produce some output that the organism that's doing the fermentation uh, benefits from or desires. And so, for example, this is one of my favorites. This is an ambrosia beetle that I had the pleasure of working on with Yuri Holster a number of years ago. And so this is a beetle that has two little pockets. And depending on the species, the pockets are in different places. And those pockets are, are sort of like uh, sourdough containers. And in those little pockety containers, it uh, feeds specific fungi. And then it goes to a, a dying tree, depending on the species of, of beetle. And it digs a hole in the tree that, that will be the hole in which its babies, um, its eggs are laid. And then it plants that sourdough culture, if you will. The sourdough culture then ferments the tree. And the babies, when they hatch, they eat the fermenting tree. And so this is a particularly beautiful version of zoofermentation, ferment, fermentation by animals in the broadest sense. But it's a reminder of the, of the reality that as we start to think about what it is to, for humans to ferment foods, that it's part of this much broader story. And today I'm going to frame this broader story in, in the context of flavor, deliciousness, and pleasure. And, and this is... Um, from work that's come from a variety of angles, but parts of it come from a project with Monica Sanchez, and that was a book project called Delicious, that aimed to think about flavor and evolution in general in the human story. And it's been a real pleasure to be able to talk to Elisa and, and David and others about flavor and what it means. And, and one of the things that's become clear, and as we've done scholarship around flavor, is that in many, many fields, flavor is centered. And so if you think about painting, 
and the Renaissance depictions of food and pleasure, they were really central in this transition in painting towards still lifes. And so in the late Renaissance, you get kings and gods displaced by a really good cheese, a pretzel, and some fruit. And, and so the pleasure of those foods is really central. Later, for early Impressionists, food provided a way to connect with realistic moments. And then for the post-Impressionists, food prompted questions about how the brain works. And, and, you know, when the brain looks at an image like this, what is it doing? And how does that relate to how we're thinking about the pleasure in this image? And then, of course, in literature, we see lots of focus on pleasure. And so this wonderful poem by William Carlos Williams is an example to a poor old woman munching a plum in the street, a paper bag of them in her hand. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. They taste good to her. You can see it by the way she gives herself to the one half sucked out in her hand. Comforted the solace of bright plums seeming to fill the air. They taste good to her. And so pleasure in all of these cases is central. Obviously for chefs, pleasure is central. But in my field, things are different. I'm an evolutionary biologist and a community ecologist. And as evolutionary biologists, I tend to think about relatedness, evolution, and comparison among species. As a community ecologist, I tend to think about interactions among species. And food is central in both of those cases, but flavor is not, nor is deliciousness. And so we can look at the crow, we can look at the chimp, we know they're making choices, we know they're eating food, that that food is central to their biology, but we almost never talk about the, what, the role that flavor and pleasure play in that. And yet animals eat, eat, and yet animals choose, and yet animals choose by flavor and pleasure. And so what I want to do today is to kind of think about the role that flavor and pleasure plays in building up to our relationship to ferments. And to do that, I'm going to talk about tool use and the origin of culture. And then I'm going to link those two things to get us to fermentation. And just, just by way of, of small background, a um, number of years ago, we found a, an old letter from my uh, great grandfather, and he was asked um, if he could comment on the history of the Methodist Church in Greenville, Mississippi, in the U.S. And he started off the letter by saying, uh, I can comment on the history of the Methodist Church in Greenville, but I need and to do so, I need to comment on the history of the Methodist Church more generally. To comment on the history of the Methodist Church more generally, I need to comment upon the history of Christianity. To comment upon the history of Christianity, I need to speak to the history of humans. And I'm a little bit like that. So I'm going to back out pretty far to, to get back to fermentation. And so I'm going to start with tool use. And the tool, to talk about tool use, I'm going to back out 4.5 billion years to give you a little bit of background on, on how we think about taste, which relates to tool use, which relates to fermentation. And so if we, if we think about the origin of, of life, the origin of life happens in, in wet environments of one kind or another. And as it happens, one of the things that, that occurs is that evolution is stingy. It, it takes advantage of what's available. And so if we look at the ancient seas, not all elements were equally present in those ancient seas. And, and so we can, we can think about it in those first life forms taking advantage of almost any element. But in fact, what they do is they take advantage of the common elements. And so there's not a ton of chemistry in this talk, but a little bit. And so what you see here is that the more common something is in ocean water, the more common it is in, in single cell marine organisms. And so natural selection favored organisms that took advantage of those elements that were common. So for example, phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon. And this seems super removed from our daily lives, except that when our ancestors dragged themselves onto the shore, they still had those same kinds of cells and our cells today still have that basic elemental composition. And this becomes a problem because once animals start eating plants on shore, there are big differences between what's available in plants and what's available in the ocean. And this is especially problematic for omnivores. And so this is one of just three figures in the whole talk that you can just work through this quickly. So the x-axis here is now the mass of different elements in animals, and the y is the difference between the plants and animals. And so the big take home here is if things are high on this figure, they're much more common in animals than in plants. And, and so the issue here is if you're eating plants, you somehow have to reconcile the fact that what your body needs and what's available in the plant is very different. And, and so there aren't many ways to do this. 
one way to do this is just to excrete a lot. And so this is what aphids do. So aphids drink sugar water and they excrete huge quantities of sugar just to get enough nitrogen and phosphorus. They basically filter out the sugar. And this has led to uh, all sorts of interesting interactions like the ants that care for these aphids to take advantage of that sugar uh, much as pastoralists care for farmers or for cattle. But this doesn't work for humans. If you had to excrete all of your excess carbon to get the nutrients you needed, it you would be very unpleasant to be around. And so, so what do other animals do? What does a raccoon, for example, do? Or a vosh bear, as it's known here, which I think is a very cute name. Uh, these, these vosh bears, what they do is they choose. Now, how do they choose? What we argue in this paper is that those choices are mediated by taste receptors and that our taste receptors evolved to lead us toward those things we on average have tended to need. And so if you look at the taste receptors we know about, so our salty taste receptors lead us toward salt, our umami taste receptors lead us toward nitrogen, which is often coupled with phosphorus. So if you eat something that's got a lot of nitrogen, also often has a lot of phosphorus. Um, we have calcium taste receptors. We don't totally understand how they work. Some other animals like cats have phosphorus taste receptors. And so these are receptors that have evolved to lead us toward what we on average needed in the past. They're pretty dumb guides, but they're helpful. And then our sweet taste receptors lead us toward easy calories. And then bitter taste, taste receptors are different. They lead us away from things. And so bitter taste receptors, the average human has 25 of them. There's actually some variation. And each one intercepts particular chemicals and sends a signal to the brain that of bitter. The signal from hops is identical to the bitter signal from coffee. And, and we perceive them as different because of the olfactory differences, the smell differences. But this is a warning. And so you have this really simple sort of uh, um, culinary uh, ethical guide, which is your tongue leads you this way and that. And then there's sour, which is totally different and ends up playing a huge role in, in fermentation, which I'm going to return to. And one of the things that's been clear in the last couple of years is that these taste receptors have evolved as animals have evolved, so as to lead them toward the right things given their dietary changes. And so we know that, as cat, that in cats, when they shifted toward being exclusively predatory, that they lost their sweet taste receptors. Cats could get enough energy from just eating their prey whole. They didn't need sugar anymore. Their sweet taste receptors broke. We know that dolphins um, and, and their lineage lost, it appears, all of their taste receptors. So we don't know what it is that, the, what, that leads them to choose their prey items, some pleasure, but we don't really know what kind. What a dolphin's pleasure is, only a dolphin knows. And then we have things like hummingbirds. So Maud Baldwin's done amazing work to show that the ancestors of hummingbirds did not have sweet taste receptors. But as hummingbirds began to switch to eating some nectar, drinking some nectar, that those sweet taste, or they had umami taste receptors, those umami taste receptors uh, evolved so as to also intercept some kinds of sugars so that the same taste receptor could reward them for their nitrogen and for the sugar they needed. What that, what that feels like to them, we, we have no idea. And then dogs, when we domesticated dogs, their taste receptors didn't change as far as we know, but they evolved extra copies of amylase genes that produced the enzyme that breaks down starch. That, that enzyme breaks down starch in their mouth to make the starch sweet. And so that dogs, that uh, it incentivizes dogs to eat the fo food that's available to them in our cities and, and towns. And so how does this relate to tool use? Well, the idea that we've advanced is that, that tool use is a way of getting toward the tastes and flavors um, that have historically have rewarded us. And the trick with tool use is how do you study the evolution of tool use? One thing you can do is you can look at things like these. These are termite sticks. They're 1.2 to 2 million years old. Our ancestors used them to dig into termite mounds. These tell us some things, but not so much. There's only so much that can be revealed from a termite stick. The other thing one can do is study our living relatives, which is um, part of what I, why I'm here in Leipzig right now, meeting with folks who do this on a daily basis, and see, see the ways in which they engage with their foods. And the great thing about studying our living relatives to look at tool use is if we look, look at our ancestry, 
you know, humans use tools often, chimps use tools often, gorillas use them sometimes, and orangutans use them sometimes. And so it's largely assumed and, and agreed that our common ancestors with chimps also use tools. And so if we study how chimps use tools, it might provide us some insight into how our ancestors use tools and get us down to the road to fermentation. I've had the luxury of working on these projects with the PANAF project based here in Leipzig. And this project has really changed our understanding of tool use in chimps because it put out camera traps at all these sites across Africa where the chimps are not habituated. And so you can see what they're doing when you're doing when people aren't looking. This is the amazing team that's done this work. And in the last few years, it's radically transformed the numbers of ways that we understand chimps to use tools. So I'll just show a quick video. Chimps harvesting algae. This is chimps accumulating stones. Nobody knows why they do this. I like that the baby is, is sitting on the uh, parent's lap here while his nuts get smashed. And so you can see that this is just a subset of what the chimps use tools to do, and it's pretty amazing. And so the question is, why do they do it? And, and There we go. Uh, and the standard answer is that they do this to get more calories to feed ever larger brains, brains that require a lot of energy and to optimize. And I think this is really a, a misdirect. And this same argument is offered both for what ch why chimpanzees use tools and for the behaviors of indigenous people around the world. It is a, um, I don't know quite what the right word is, racist in the human context and uh, de-intellectualizing or something in the chimpanzee context perspective that assumes that the, the chimps and also hunter-gatherers are robots that just be, um, do the optimal thing. And I think this is deeply problematic and, and it seems far more likely to me that rather than optimizing, and this is what Monica and I have argued, um, you know, when we, we ourselves are not very good at optimizing, right? Our cereal aisle is a pretty good indication. But what if instead of optimizing, our ancestors used tools uh, to get more tasty foods and those foods happened on average to have more calories? And so what if these are tools of culinary pleasure? If that were the case, what we would expect to see is that foods that chimps get with tools should be tastier than those otherwise available. And what's handy about this is that we can actually study this because chimps have very similar sweet taste receptors to humans apparently similar to sour taste receptors, salt taste receptors, and umami taste receptors. And so to some extent, when, when we taste something they eat, we're tasting some measure of what they experience. Not identical, but some measure. Their bitter taste receptors are quite different. So if what we eat their food and it's bitter, it doesn't tell us very much. And so what's it like if you eat their food? The good news here is that uh, chimpanzee researchers for years have walked around behind chimps eating everything they eat. Uh, Professor Toshi Nishida was the expert at this. He tasted hundreds of foods eaten by the chimps, and then he compared how they tasted. And he did this at a site not far from where Jane Goodall worked in Mahali Mountain National Park in Tanzania. And here were the results. And so lots of things the, the chimps ate were sweet. Some were sweet and bitter. Some were bland. Some things we eat are bland too. Some were sour. Some were sweet and sour. And we don't, some were bitter, but we don't really know what that means. And the sweetest fruits were the most preferred, both by Nishida and the chimpanzees. And even the sweets, though, weren't very sweet. They were instead a bit bland. In comparison, the foods that the chimps get from their tool use, so ants and algae and honey and termites, are delicious. And we know they're delicious. We like the same things. Um, all of these foods that the chimps used to, tools to get humans also eat. And so that's in line with what we would expect if taste is the guide rather than optimization. But we also might expect to sometimes see chimps eat things that taste good, but don't benefit them. Does that happen? 
And one of the cases where it clearly happens is that the chimps eat ants all the time. And yet study after study has found no nutritional benefit to eating ants. In fact, they're rarely digested. And so in chimp feces, the ants are largely intact. And the inter interpretation of chimpanzee researchers is that these are just snacks. Another example, which I love, is work by Victoria Etienne, who studied chimpanzees in, in Luongo and Gabon. And she studies chimps that use these great big thick sticks to get to honey that's below ground. And so she was trying to figure out how do they do this? How long do they take? And what she found was that they sometimes dig for months or even years to get to an individual nest. And they do this even though they get no more than about a half a liter of honey, 2000 calories, and that they then have to divide that honey with whoever happens to be there at the time. And so there's no way this is optimal. Honey is just delicious. And then another example, Maureen McCarthy and Jack Lester work with chimpanzees in the Bodongo Bugama Corridor in Uganda. And this is a fragmented habitat where the chimps can stay in forests, but they can also leave forests. And what they've found is that the chimps willingly leave forests to go forage in sugarcane plantations. And they eat sugarcane and eat more sugarcane and eat more sugarcane. And when they're finished with that, they eat jackfruit. And so it clearly looks like this is, this is uh, appealing to their tastes. And, and there's no sense that this is an optimization. It's almost certainly more sugar than they need, and it's probably problematic for their health and well-being. And yet, it tastes good to her. You can see it by the way she gives herself to the one half sucked out in her hand. And then my favorite case of this is this fruit, Pinta de Plandra Braziana. And this is a fruit that tastes very sweet to humans. I was just I just gave a talk which I talked about this fruit and two people in the audience grew up eating this fruit in Africa and, and people love it. It's very sweet tasting, but, but gorillas don't eat it, which is really intriguing. And Elaine Guevara has shown that part of what's going on with this fruit is, is that it's very unusual. It's not actually producing sugars. It's sweet because it produces a protein that mimics a sugar and it kind of zooms around this taste receptor and hits it on its elbow. And so it's tricking the taste receptor. And for the fruit, this is advantageous because it's way cheaper to produce a little bit of this protein than a lot of sugar. But it means if you eat this fruit, you're not getting any of the sweetness and calories you think you're getting. You're getting the sweetness, but not the calories. And what Elaine has shown is that, that gorillas have actually evolved a sweet taste receptor that's immune to this protein. It's not tricked by it. And her interpretation of what happened here is that some of the gorillas like the falsely sweet fruit so much that their health suffered. Others like them less. The latter gorillas were more likely to thrive and reproduce. It's only their descendants that survive. And so this is a pretty amazing case of gorillas indulging so much in something that was not beneficial that the natural selection had to intervene. And then, of course, our own choices are not optimal. So it seems like there's something might be going on here. So that's one piece. Second piece before we get to the fermentation, the origin of culture. Chimpanzee cultures are really built around culinary traditions. Whether you use the word culture is a hotly debated topic among people who study chimps. And so we could call it culinary traditions. I think of it as a culture. And we see this if we look across populations. Different chimp populations use different tools to do different things. And this can persist for years. Um, for more than 50 years now, the Chimps at Gombe National Park eat, have eaten chromatogaster ants and army ants with their sticks. And at Mahale National Park, 70 kilometers to the south, same forest, same ants that eat Campanotis ants. And so it's, it's culinary tradition. It's passed on for decades. In one case, in West Africa, there's a site where there's evidence of chimps using the same tools for 4,000 years. And so how do these cultures emerge? A culture where you eat this ant one place and you eat that ant another place. Whatever is going on here, it's pretty important to our story of how we spread around the world and, and lay hold of new kinds of foods and new ways of eating. Could be genetic, genetic differences in taste or smell. We have some, but the evidence for that's pretty modest and they tend to be modest tweaks. Or it could be learning, but how does that learning happen before you get the ability to, to create words and to verbalize. Part of this is, is smell and smell learning, which becomes very important in fermentation. And so in humans, we have a really unusually shaped head that actually features not sniffing, which is orthonasal smell, but the smell that happens once a food is in your mouth. 
and the, the molecules from that food go up and around and hit your smell receptor cells. And so we actually have um, a sense of smell that features food that's in our mouth. It would, it would be far less interesting if you were a chef cooking for dogs than for humans, or you would do it very differently because of how different this is. And most of the features we love in our foods today have to do with smell. But what's interesting about smell is that the smells we love are, as far as neuroscientists understand, totally learned. And so you, you are born with, um, there are no genetically uh, favored smells and genetically disfavored smells. As far as neuroscientists understand, even the smell of cadavers or feces has to be learned to be a disliked smell. Conversely, the smell of bread or anise has to be learned as a liked smell. And I think this is kind of like a card catalog where when you smell a smell, your brain creates a kind of noun, a subject, and to that is attached more text, but that text is a memory. So think about Proust Madeline. It's a memory of a cookie that reminds you of a specific moment. And, and so it connects that subject to the moment and that memory. And then it's also assigned a valence. So is it good or bad? And so all that accumulates through individual instances. And the more you smell a type of smell, the more subjects you get and the more finely you discern them. And this is starting to be understood pretty well from a neuroscience perspective, but it's not yet well integrated into how ecologists think, or I think even how chefs think. But it's potentially pretty important if we think about the landscapes in which our ancestors were moving, because if they could learn good smells and bad smells, they could then use that library to make their decisions. And what's really interesting and really important, I think, to fermentation is that this begins really early in life. And so a study, a series of studies in France has now shown us that if mothers eat a certain food, that they can pass on a preference to that food for, to, their, to their baby when it's born, if pregnant mothers um, eat a certain food. And so one study was done in which mothers were given anise or not anise candies. And then right at birth, their babies were given the smell of anise to, to see what, how they responded. And what they found was that the, the babies whose mother had eaten, mothers had eaten anise would do this lick-lipping pleasure face when they were given the anise smell, which is like a nursing face. And so they had learned in utero to like anise. And the babies who had not would do this displeasure face, which is really consistent. And it's now been shown that the babies can learn in utero to like garlic, to like fermented fish, to like blue cheese, to like vegetables. And the, this is now increasingly well documented across mammals. And so what's amazing to think about here is if you think about our ancestors moving around the world, this is a way in one generation that you could learn good smells from bad smells. You can learn new foods and pass them on to your next generation. And you can do that even before you can talk, even before your species can talk. And so this is potentially very powerful and, and it's embedded in how we teach about food today. And I think it's something we can embed in our education more generally. So how does this now relate to fermentation? Well, if we think about the fermentation, there are basically three kinds of, of rot. Um, there's unsafe rot, which is diverse. You can think about a fruit that's rotting. Uh, it could be my, so it could be a fungal mycelium, a penicillium, pen, penicillium like growth. It can be dangerous. It could be certain bacteria that are dangerous. And so there's this broad category of unsafe, lots of ways of being unsafe. And then a fermentation of a fruit can be yeasty, so alcoholic, or it can be lactic acid infused, and so acidic. And what's really key here is that the, the first case is dangerous and you want to avoid it. And the second two cases are safe because the alcohol and the, and the alcoholic fermentation kills the bad things and the lactic acid and the acidic fermentation kills bad things too. And, and so this becomes important as we think about our ancestors beginning to ferment. And I think allows fermentation to be practiced far earlier, earlier than we used to think. And so work by Katie Amato and Liz Mallet, for example, is considered a case in which a capuchin monkey uh, gathers almendra fruits, which are too big for it to chomp on and too hard. And the first time Liz Mallet saw this, the, the capuchin monkeys were throwing these fruits in the ground and then they would just leave. And so it looked like a ton of work for nothing, like totally maladaptive. And then what Liz saw later is that the chimps were actually coming back three weeks later once those fruits had started to rot and they were acidic and a little kombucha-y, 
and then they'd soften and then they would eat them. And, and Liz has now seen this three times. It actually looks like control of fermentation by these capuchin monkeys. And, and so the capuchin monkeys could do this if they could just harness some pretty simple learning around aromas associated with lactic fermentations, aroma, aromas associated with alcohol, and the taste associated with sourness and sweetness. And then you have the other case, which is related, of fermenting meat, which I think also could be far earlier than we used to think. And so Dan Fisher, uh, who's a uh, archaeologist, paleoanthropologist at the University of Michigan, a number of years ago now, started finding mastodon sites where it looked like mastodons were pushed into ponds. And so what he'd find was that a mastodon in a pond, and then evidence that it had been sort of anchored to the bottom of the pond. And so what Dan started to argue is maybe hunter-gatherers were pushing these mastodons into the pond to store and ferment them so they could eat them for longer. You know, imagine you're with your family of 12 people, you kill a mastodon, you eat really well for like three days, and then you feel like, you know, you can't possibly eat more mastodon, but you've still got three quarters of a mastodon to go. If you could put it in a lake and ferment it, you could potentially eat it for a year. And so how do you think about this? Well, what Dan did was a friend of his had a horse that died and Dan quickly got the horse. He got some buddies together. They made stone Clovis tools. They butchered the horse. They put the horse in the pond. They anchored it with its own intestines. And, and then they, they came back over time to figure out what had happened. And so they did some microbiological studies or sort of um, pr pretty simple ones. But then they also did that chef study, which is that Dan tasted this meat every month or so. And what he found is that even six months into being in the pond, it was still edible. And Dan said it had a flavor like Stilton cheese and steak all in one. And what was he doing? You know, he was he was tasting it to see if it was safe. And, and what flavors did it have? It had these acidic and, and uh, fruity flavors that we associate with a safe fermentation. And so imagine that one learns the right smell, the bodily smell of a good ferment, and the acts that engender that smell, which in turn become encoded in the rituals and norms. Much as a doctor could once sniff out a sick patient, cooks could sniff out a good ferment. What's really interesting about this idea is that we see changes in our genes associated with what looks like fermentation. And so about 8 million years ago, our AP ancestors evolved a version of alcohol dehydrogenase that supersizes their ability to metabolize alcohol. And so at that point, their ability to metabolize alcohol was 40-fold greater. And changes in the brain appear to have occurred that made a buzz more likely. And so the potential for, for a drunken enjoyment of fermentation is also changing at this time. Roughly about the same time, our ancestors also evolved a lactate receptor in their tissues and those receptors tell the immune system to calm down and tell the body to stop metabolizing fat. There's lactate, there's sugar. And so both of these look like responses to ingesting more alcoholic fermentations and more lactic fermentations. And, and so this starts to get really interesting. And it started to get us interested in thinking about, well, what's happening with taste in this context? And what is sour taste doing here? And it turned out that almost nothing was, was done on sour taste and its uh, ecology and evolution. I'm going to wrap up here so we can talk. And so we started looking at this and like the, one of the only places people seem to consider sour taste is on the internet. And so there are plenty of videos of do my dog didn't like this lemon. You can go ahead and Google it now. And in general, what these videos show is a dog tasting a lemon, a dog making a scrunchy, dissatisfied face, and then a dog really mad at a lemon. And so this suggests that dogs don't like lemons uh, and sour taste, but in fact, there are no studies of dogs and sour taste. And so we started to compile the data. What do we know about sour taste? And did the first ever analysis of sour taste across vertebrates. And there's lots here, but one of the things we found is that most vertebrates, um, so all vertebrates we had, could find data on can taste acidity. And so respond to it in one way or another. Um, all of the cases in purple are cases where the vertebrates disliked acidity. And so this is the sort of standard case that the vertebrate tastes an acidic food and responds negatively to it and avoids it. 
And then you get these weird cases in our own lineage where species are clearly attracted to sour. And it's mostly in primates and especially in apes. And so it looks like this is an evolutionary response to something about diet. And it's intriguing to wonder if, the, if part of the response in our own lineage is a response to a shift in how much fermented food we were ingesting. And so it's intriguing, lots more to study. But I'm gonna close here with a term because when people study domestication, the general idea is the species that is the domesticate is the one that responds evolutionarily to the mutualism. And so, you know, pig growth form and behavior responded to human selection, but humans didn't respond in any way to dis domesticating pigs. What's really interesting is if we think about these microbes that we favored in the context of fermentation, the yeasts and lactic acid bacteria in particular, they changed some, but relatively late in the story, but we changed far more. And, and we passed them along via our vessels and bowls. And so, and so what if, as we rethink our relationship to these organisms, what if we rethink this story as one in which lactic acid bacteria and yeasts have domesticated us through producing molecules that we like? And so imagine they produced alcohol, that alcohol makes us more likely to gather up more fruit to give to them. It makes us more likely to store fruit to give to them. Eventually, it makes us more likely to find ways to even take grain and turn it into food for yeasts. And so to, to figure out how to malt. And then it leads us to figure out how to domesticate grains so that we can feed them to the yeasts. And, and then a subset of those yeast lineages figure out even how to get us to industrialize the production just of those yeast lineages. And, and so I think one of the questions that, that is really open for, for humanists to think about as we think about these relationships is the extent to which we can retell all of the stories I've just told you, but from the perspective of these other organisms co-opting our sense of pleasure and deliciousness and all that it entails. And I'll close here with the recognition that as we think about this, that it's actually a phenomenon that's far bigger than just our food. Because as David mentioned earlier, what we've been able to show and others have since shown in other contexts is that when you ferment food, your body changes too, your body microbes change too. And so these fermentations aren't just about having beer or having bread or having yogurt. They're really about a transformation of an entire life way to facilitate this relationship. And how do we best think about that? And I think we're really just at the beginning of the story of imagining these relationships and, and talking about them and thinking about what they mean for our future. So I'll close there. I'm sorry if I got a little delayed on slides there, but thanks for hanging with me. It's That's all good. We're, uh, we're happy we got to see as much as we did. Thank you for the amazing talk. Um, this, was, this was great. Really, really my bread and butter. Both fermented, by the way, um, if they're good anyhow. Um, this is fantastic. And really in line with kind of my current thinking, um, I just, I, I, was, I was hanging out with Elisa just last week. It was a few days ago. She was like, oh, what are you reading right now? And uh, I had to pull up um, The Evolution of Beauty by Richard Prung. And this is about bird sex. It's about the evolution of, of some of the most beautiful organisms on Earth. And his big argument, his thesis in, in defense of Darwin's theory of sexual selection, is that it's not adaptive. It's that sometimes beauty evolves for beauty's sake. Um, but near the end of the book, and this is where it really kind of matches up with everything that you've just been talking about, um, he talks about the fact that for beauty to evolve, the desire for beauty has to, to, to co-evolve in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. And he makes a comparison to art. And it feels like kind of the argument that you're making is that the same process is happening in our own understanding of the world through taste receptors. And that, you know, there are these compensatory changes that are happening in humanity, whether, and you didn't touch on it, but 
um, lactate persistence, you know, uh, our, our ability to cozy up to ungulates and, and the walking fermenters that are cows and all the dairy that they produce and all the dairy that we ferment um, has literally changed the genome of a huge swath of, of humankind. Um, and as an, an evolutionary biologist yourself, how, I mean, I was just looking back on the shelf for, maybe you know him, John, John, John Thompson, Relentless Evolution. He argues that all evolution is co-evolution. Do you feel like fermentation is a really great way to, to, do you believe in that yourself? Do you believe that there are any evolutionary processes that happen in the absence of, of changes elsewhere in the world and other organisms? And if yes or no, how do you think fermentation plays into that, into like the co-evolutionary force? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think that most evolutionary change that we study and think about happens in response to a landscape that has other organisms. And so there's an evolutionary response to the realities of those organisms. And so that's ever present for most of the, I mean, you can think about, I can think about probably obscure cases, like a single species in a um, hydrothermal, but, I, but I'm stretching to find them, right? And so uh, the, the living landscape is this part of every evolutionary story. And I think there's a really interesting philosophical piece there that a lot of that evolution happens in the context of the sensory worlds of those organisms, whether it's a plant sensory world, an animal sensory world, that those responses are mediated by what's seen and not seen. And I've been fascinated lately with how different that is depending on the sense that you're considering. You know, and so it's Cezanne, the, the painter thought a lot about um, <laughs> what can I paint that would show that would in essence show what the brain is doing to turn these strokes into an image, right? And so the for vision, the brain is composing these pieces into a whole. For olfaction, the pieces are being um, united into one composite in a different way. Taste is this other thing. And that the, the way in which evolution responds to those different senses is, is so intriguing. And every animal species has a sense world, right? That is framing how we interact with it. And, and so the ant has a sense world, you know, the plant has a sense world, the bacteria in your gut have a sense world. And that to me is really fascinating. Um, and I also like that, you know, we tend to, to give humans a lot of agency, like we're really smitten with our free will and our conscious decision-making. Um, but, but I think far more often, like our decisions are way more like the decisions the bacteria in our guts are making. And, and so if we relax this assumption of free will, like what do those comparisons look like? And I think one of the things that humanists have been doing is to, to give those non-humans more agency. It, it, and it's a way of giving us less agency and sort of, sort of think about these evolutionary stories on more equal terms, which I think is really interesting. Um, but yeah, all, we're always evolving relative to each other. And what does it look like to have a future where we favor a kind of evolution relative to each other that's more mutually beneficial? How would we frame a story? And like, could fermentation help us to get there? And, and I, I think the other piece that's interesting here is that some species seem to trigger societal change that's, that leads to inequality and, and all kinds of bad things. So sugar. Right, domestication of crops to produce sugar uh, is a huge part of slavery, and so there there is a domestication event that leads to one kind of of change. Are there ways that we can use fermentation and the unique qualities of fermentation to engender different kinds of societies where benefits are more democratic? You know what what can we do there? Which is interesting to me. I'm off track now, though. David, right. It's, I think it still counts. It still counts. Um, 
uh, yeah, I, I mean, even, you know, to talk about domestication, if, if you'd like. And yes, the domestication event and to the triangle trade from Africa to the, to the West Indies and back to Europe. Lots of bad things happen from that. Um, but in, in your final comment about, you know, it's like, is it the microbes that domesticated us? Um, in, in all my research on, you know, even, even the, the beer before bread hypothesis, but mm -hmm. regardless, us cozying up to kind of the most potent protein rich grasses and really committing to it, um, you know, season after season, it goes hand in hand with, with the, 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 the kind of dawn of civilization story of whether that's you know, Peru or the Indus Valley or, or the, the, the Nile Delta with permanent settlements that went on to become like long-lived empires. So in some ways, the fermentation of alcohol shows up in each one of those instances. Yeah. It is the initial creation of the domus, you mm -hmm. could say. And so it, it kind of is the yeast bringing us home for the first time in human history into a place yeah. that we keep coming back to. The grain cellars, the, the houses, the hearth, all of it. Um, oh, you kind of touched on so much during your talk. One thing that I, I find fascinating, and this is really kind of up your alley, um, and everyone in the comments, feel free to, everyone watching, feel free to ask Rob while we still have him here uh, for the next 10 minutes. Um, the zoo fermentation of it all. I love all of the examples where you kind of reach to Veronica's here as well, you know, the, whether that's leaf cutter ants and they're farming a fungus or, you know, the ambrosia beetle that you mentioned. You have written so many books about so many varied topics. Do you think you could fill one with just examples of zoo fermentation? Are there that many that you've come across in, in your work? There, there are that many. That many of them are not well studied, mm. um, and a lot of them are um, anecdotes where you've got to keep digging, you know. And so, uh, there's a case of hyenas dragging their prey items into the ocean and salting them, and then dragging them back onto shore. Uh, and so, you have these intriguing cases like that, but nobody's then gone to study it or. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wolverines bury their prey items and then come back to them. And it's been noted for years that the prey items smell sort of acidic um, and sort of amine uh, when when um, people find them. And so is, you know, is there some control? And so a lot of cases like that. And then the ones that we know about that where the control is really good, like where it's really clearly an active kind of control tend to be from insects. But even there, we've studied just a teeny, group of them um you know there's a spider in mexico that was studied in 1960 and shown to favor a yeast in its web that attracts flies never been studied again like that not only is that phenomenon never been studied again but like the that spider has never been studied again and so i i think you could for sure fill a book but i think the you would be leaning heavily on those cases, life like leaf cutter ants, like ambrosia beetles, like the fungus farming termites, um, like honeybees. You know, honeybees ferment their pollen, uh, make a bee bread. Bee bread. Um, yeah. and, and so I think there's a lot of, I don't know um, how many students are out there, but there's a lot of opportunity for students to dig into some of these cases. And I think, you know, one of the things Veronica's work is showing is that I mean, you can go to these cases and you can study them as metaphors for human fermentation from which we can learn things. But it's also often the case that the microbes they're using are also microbes we could use to do things. And so there's like these two ways of learning, which is really intriguing. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll not steal Veronica's thunder for some future talk, but I think that there's... Um, you know, there's an open question about the extent to which historically humans have, have borrowed from these other species and in, in their microbes. You know, where do these microbes come from in the first place? And so I'll, I'll take a different example, which is that the in the wild, where we find brewer's yeast is in wasp guts. And, and so there's a group in Italy, and we work some on this too, that's argued that that's the natural habitat of those yeasts and that the wasps carry them from sugar source to sugar source. Mm 
and that we co-opted that relationship. And so I think that's the other fun piece to pull out in a, and it's gotta be, I think it's your next book, David. The, uh, um, in that book on zero fermentation. Um, cool. Yeah, but it would be fun. Think... It would for sure be fun. Yeah. It just, it just really reminds me of, of, I just, earlier this year, I read Ed Young's An Immense World. And it's just such a great, yeah. Maybe it's his next book. It's just such a great, like, let's look at the whole animal kingdom and let's just find the, the most amazing, most compelling stories of, of all the ways they're they're weird and different than us and the same as us as well. And it just feels like it's very much up that track. Um, also regarding like taste and disgust, mm -hmm. um, back, back a lifetime ago when I was at um, restaurant Noma, I was working on a podcast that we never released and I wrote like an hour long <laughs> I should just do it um I wrote like an hour long episode on on disgust and I really dug into Paul Rosen's work um and I was surprised to learn it was one of those uncomfortable moments where I'm like oh, I thought it was one way but it's another mm -hmm. um that yeah that babies aren't primed to think that poo is gross or that like dead cats smell bad you know they are learned effects and even having a young child myself I kind of see the ways that I'm engendering when I'm like, oh, take that out of your mouth, it's gross. Those sorts of reactions in him. But I've also, since doing that podcast years ago, have like now come across studies that, again, reading Delicious and, and the one about the anise and eating garlic and these strong flavors that make their way into the amniotic fluid. Even beyond that, um, in mice, finding epigenetic responses to odors that are then associated with like negative feedback, like the stick and the smell that then get transferred like before a, a mother mouse is ever even pregnant. Yeah. Transferred into her litter. Three generations, they, I think. Yeah, exactly. So what is that telling us about our, our relationship to pleasures in the natural world or, or the kind of like gene culture co-evolution through chimps or, or human culture? Yeah. Or, that's a great so there's as far as I know there's one study that showed that that um three generation transfer of of its fear so it was a sm smell associated with the some kind of bad thing somebody did to a mouse and th that the fear of that smell passed three generations it's not been repeated that study and people are it was a small study but it's really intriguing so I would love to see it considered more um but if that's real, it gives us this legacy of pleasure, but also of, of disgust, and uh, which then frames all the kinds of ways we interact with our food, but also with each other. And how do we think about that, right? But what does that mean to us if we're if we are? Um, what's the language? <laughs> if we are circumscribed by the dislikes of our ancestors, right? right? Like what is, how do we think about that? And and then the other, the other piece that's interesting there is so most, a lot of mammals, I don't know to say most, but they have a vomeral nasal organ and it's, so it's separate from olfaction. It works like olfaction, um, separate little piece right up in here. And it's associated with odors that are innately aversive or attractive. So pheromones or, and so mice, it's the smell of cat pee and pheromones. And so, and in fish, the cadaverine and putrescine are innately aversive via that same organ. It's not thought that humans have one, but we actually don't know. And and the way we mostly talk about smells is through conscious smells, but a whole pile of what happens with olfaction is subconscious. And, and, and so I'm not even sure we would know we knew, um, or help, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And so I think there are other things there, you know, like what is our, um, and we're at the end here, but the, I think sometimes our subconscious bodies have way more productive responses to our ferments than our conscious minds do and to microbes. You know, our, mm -hmm. our bodies are feeding microbes that we need even when our conscious minds are going to kill it. Mm -hmm. 
So what is it? What if we have more conscious decision making than we think in these this olfactory world? How do we think about that? It's very fun, but also a little bit scary. I think an interesting part of that too is just the research coming out now about the role that gut microbiome might be playing in all of these, especially kind of going back to the beginning of your talk when you were talking about taste and the importance of taste and calories with sugar. But then we do things like eat bitter things all the time. We eat vegetables, brassicas. That's the, you know, probably one of the main sources of vegetables in the rest of the world are all very bitter, but we still crave them and eat them. And they're probably feeding our gut microbe. That's what they're doing. They're not giving us that many calories in their own. Um, and so that is a very exciting, I think, next step in the gut brain axis research field too, and understanding all of that and the impact of the gut microbiome on that. And I mean, that's somebody else's book, but the word crave, right? The, our understanding of what it means to crave something is like, it's, it's like we're starting today. And, and, um, and it, it's also one of these, like, I love giving talks like this and being able to, to hear questions because like the, often the questions frame a disconnect between how scientists are studying something and everybody else's experience of the world. And yeah. craving is one of those, like everybody can relate to cravings, like pregnant women can relate to cravings. And, and yet the science of understanding neurologically what's going on with the craving, how it's mediated by the microbiome, how it's mediated by receptors. I remember hearing from Fiona Gribble at a certain point who studies um, endocrine cells in the gut. Um, and she was proposing that craving is actually uh, your gut microbiome response from what you ate the day before. And so based on some ratio of metabolites they're making, you're going to be craving something to feed those while kind of satiety eating and hunger cues are all more just your physiological kind of I'm low in calories or I'm high in calories and some full or I'm hungry. But instead, when you have a craving for something, that's your microbes telling you we need more of this thing. Um, so that's, I mean, that'd be really cool to, to know more on that story. I mean, to me, that's like um, the next time some scientists act smug about what we know, like the, to, to, as a reminder that we, we don't even know if cravings is us, right? <laughs> or right. them. Yeah, right. exactly. So much unknown. And any, anyway, I, uh, Rob, I, I think we're at time, uh, even though we lost a bit of time there with, with, with PowerPoint, but um, for the sake of, of respecting everyone else who's, who maybe have to get on to other things, I would just like to thank you so much for closing out uh, what's been a, an amazing series with so much food for thought um, at the intersection of, of fermentation and health and the microbiome um, with this fantastic talk. Uh, Elisa, do you have any, as, as kind of our lead organizer on this, do you have any closing statements? I just want to thank everyone. And we'll just send out a feedback form as well, just to kind of hear if other people have um, speakers they want to hear um, or just kind of ideas for next steps. But um, yeah, this it has been recorded, so we'll post it online. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Yeah. Th thank you it's all so much. Pleasure. Great. Have a great night, everyone. See you Bye. next season. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Rob. Thanks again.